on subjectivity and intersubjectivity. So, I'd like to discuss how layered meanings can be characterized in the context of historical change. And my talk focuses on the case of Japanese grammatical constructions and how their functions have extended, uh, resulting in polysemy and possibly indicating changes in progress. And then I'm interested in what kinds of cognitive and communicative processes are involved on Hero's end. So I would like to introduce and discuss a specific method that I employed, namely semantic um, judgment tests. And um, again, this is a work in progress. And just to clarify, by layering um, in, a, in the context of talking about grammar, I'm talking about, um, for example, three-way distinction between so-called propositional level meaning and uh, modality speech act, uh, modality meaning, so-called modality, and speech act. These are sort of simple terms, but uh, for, for the sake of clarity. And I didn't make this up, of course, and, um, and I have, although I have simplified terms, this is, um, have been talked about in a tradition of functional grammar, of um, syntax and semantics, role and reference grammar, and uh, Van Valen, and Tori, and Van Valen. And in Japanese, there are many others, but, um, and also uh, Shinsato in Japanese, in the context of Japanese research. So this is what I mean by layering. And I'm going to use the term um, referential for propositional, although propositional meanings are not quite, sometimes not referential, but just to mean not subjective, not intersubjective. And uh, I'm going to use uh, so-called modal-like concept, subjective, because it's speaker anchored, and also intersubjective for uh, meaning um, to, um, that uh, indicates speech at the level, uh, speaker's attitude. Just to show an English analogy, kind of, kind of. Um, so it starts from a least subjective level. A sound is kind of fish. It's a descriptive meaning of type. And, uh, and then it becomes more subjective over time. I'm kind of a musician, so kind of refers to musicianship, the subjective judgment toward that. Um, how musician like you are. And then more subjective, uh, you should kind of try harder. So it's not doing any of these things, but it's really about your attitude towards um, the utterance itself. So I'm interested in the historical context, the subjectification process whereby the meaning of a form becomes more speaker oriented and the intersubjectification, the second step, process whereby a meaning of a form becomes more obviously oriented. So these are talked about by a number of, um, number of uh, scholars like Traugat and Traugat and Dasher and uh, many others. And uh, so another example which is close to the case study that I'm going to talk about um, is English example, uh, the construction, I'm afraid, it's going to rain. It expresses attitude for the fact that it's going to rain. Of course, it's context dependent. That it's really up to the interpreter uh, of the sentence. But also, I'm afraid I can't make it. If you are sensitive about refusing the proposal or invitation, then this is interpreted as a inter having intersubjective meaning attitude towards saying that it is. Uh, sorry, it is going. I can't make it. Sorry, it is a typo. Yes. So, um, with this in mind, these examples in mind, I'm interested in Japanese grammaticalized auxiliaries, and in particular, just the one. And I'm bringing this the issue up, like of. Um, so basically, this talk is not so much about the the paper I'm writing or. Uh, you know, independent paper with the findings, but it's more, I would like to address bringing up the issue of methodology itself. So, and I'm doing this now because I want to eventually extend my, the scope of my research to other constructions. So, I'm going to revisit some of the judgment tests I've done in the past and sort of um, step back and see um, if 
methods need to be modified and so on. So this is a disclaimer that I won't have like a conclusion about that study itself, at least the definite one. So uh, I have to um, explain a little bit about what this shimao, the construction shimao is. So um, it has grammaticalized from the verb shimao to originally it meant put away or finish, and now expresses multiple meanings with shades of intersubjectivity, including, so this one is, I finished doing my homework. It's a spectral meaning, so it's not subjective yet. And then, also another sort of referential, spontaneity, natural occurrence, and uh, now um, the meaning, so I'm talking about in the span of the past 300 years or so. And uh, so grammaticalized first in the 17th century, and, and then saifuga nakunatte shimatta. Over time, um, it became... What did that last sentence mean? Oh, sorry, saifuga. Mm -hmm. I lost my book. <laughs> Thank you. And then, uh, this is pretty recent. I think that this is better, so I think that this is the best um, translation I can, up, I can come up with. And also, there is a variation, uh, shimao versus chao. Chao is a contracted form uh, which eventually emerged along the way. Uh, I can't pinpoint the what the year, but it's pretty new, uh, relatively new. And my original, the research that I'm working on, which I'm not going to focus on, but I was, I uh, wanted to look at the, how the function for my variants um, come to have a split function, functionality. Uh, I'm going to, I want to argue that um, how the contracted form is now um, taking a more sub intersubjective um, function. But that's uh, another whole new paper talk. Okay, so just to demonstrate how far this grammaticalization subjectification thing goes, now it has a, a now chao, shimao has a positive meaning. Um, so, this is actually a um, product name, chestnut, Japanese chestnut product name. So, I sort of daring humbly guilty, peeled off the chestnut skin for you, made it into a product, so it is. It's a, Chestnut skin is very um, hard and tough, so it's the chow is used in this context. So I regrettably, but I'm being positive and good thing that I did it. <laughs> so I'm um, this is that product. <laughs> Which I don't know if you can get it in your neighborhood. Um, so uh, this what's funny about this, uh, interesting about Shimao is that, um, so meaning it extends over time and it's polysemous. But also, it retains all the meanings, and which is not exotic thing. But uh, Shimao often have, in one single token instance, you can have all three meanings at the same time. So when you do judgment test, I often see out there in different studies, um, judges, informants are forced to um, pick one of the four functions, for example. So but my judgment test is devised so that they can, that allows, so that it allows more than two interpretations. So that you can correctly, more accurately account for the fact that um, there's a layer of meaning from synchronic view at least. So questions are how do we know that the form construction has undergone or is undergoing subjectification or undersubject? intersubjectification process, how can we empirically identify subjective and intersubjective meanings? Um, yes, um, there are many, question, uh, many um, studies out there that um, show some also syntactic evidence, like corpus-based uh, corpus studies. For example, uh, Tishimao, Japanese auxiliary, tend to go right periphery toward the outside. Uh, the, the scope increases and so on. So you can um, see the symptom of this functional change. But then, um, yes, and also, so that's what I mean by morpheme order. And collocation, what kind of adjective can occur with that 
may indicate that functional semantic change have taken place. And also, this happened a lot in big data research and the collocation. And but how do you know that given home is used as a marker of regret or politeness, for example? How do you know that this person is using a subject? I mean, there's a you know, there's no clear boundary, of course we know, but it would be nice to be able to objectively um, characterize what peers think about these usages. And also another issue is meaning change does not necessarily surface because the analysis occurs first, which doesn't surface in uh, linguistic forms. And uh, when speakers use analogy to extend uses to other syntactic context, that's when we know all semantic change occurred. But the reanalysis, when speakers, hearers are doing semantic reanalysis, we can't really see um, what the hearers, speakers are actually thinking. And, um, and this is actually disgusting. I didn't list it, Hop and Tragat and uh, um, a number of literature uh, research and uh, grammaticalization theory. So uh, what I did in the past was to see um, how uh, hearers who are presented with um, excerpts of usage of Shimau and or Chao um, just uh, I, I'm going to tell you more about the actual method, but here's what I found. Um, so based on 182 tokens, by the way, this is very labor intensive. Each person takes maybe five to seven hours to go through all the examples to understand the context and do the judgment test. So uh, in, uh, to this end, I have that it's not very quantitative in a strict sense. And uh, completion, spontaneity, uh, sort of called the preferential meanings, uh, for T7. Uh, and the regret subjectivity, modality like um, meaning, is the most dominant one. And the most dominant. And the subjectivity is emerging based on this here based judgment test. So, uh, research context how can we characterize that? I did say that, sorry. Uh, formal and functional variation of Japanese constructions was in my actual research purpose, which I'm not going to focus on, but then I will focus on semantic judgment test method itself. Okay. And so this was, uh, as I said before, now I'm focusing on judgment test, provide uh, objective criteria for classifying examples. And this time, what I did differently this time, which actually I collected this data a few years ago, two years ago, and I wanted to see what informants are actually thinking, not just the results of these rating tasks, and thinking process and strategy in interpreting the usage. And I don't know if I get to uh, introduce um, many comments, but at least to give you the idea. So I was interested in ambiguous cases where different informants chose different answers, and a single information informant had difficulty coming up, up with an answer. And these cases can be very important. And I was looking at factors based on my previous experience in conducting judgment tests. I thought here are some of the things that were going on in their mind. And first, they are thinking about this course context. Um, so we're in an excerpt that Shimao uh, and appears and what has been said before. And similarity uh, to and contrast with the other examples. Similarities, sorry, and contrast with other uh, examples. And so they may be, this is what happens to me when I, when I am an uh, informant of native Japanese people. Uh, so I'm thinking about, oh, there's a similar example before that shows up. I'm going to answer the same way just to be consistent. So you're using analogy with the previously presented examples. And also personal judgment, uh, what is considered negative, uh, it varies depending on us. So there are individual differences, which is not a trivial matter. And uh, projecting the own strategies, I would say this, 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 she must be doing this because I would do this in this context. And uncertainty, 
you, you just are not sure, so you picked one or the other, or they did A slash B. So data I use to focus on, but I, I'm not going to go um, over that detail, but I use Cobra, uh, really, really Cobra, but I wanted to control the zone. I wanted to make sure that um, there were uh, interview style, because I also have another set of research on L2, L2, L2 data, that I wanted to be consistent, consistent, but I'm not looking at L2 data. And so interview style and the method decimal uh, contracted from child were extracted, a hundred of, of three taken out of all these hours or hours of transcription, that's all I found. But then uh, thinking about the burden of the like, raiders, uh, I think this is pretty reasonable, <laughs> but it's not many. So referential meaning completion um, and started uh, finished homework sense and uh, and as I explained before. So this is what I did. Which one of the two types of meaning of Tishima uh, included completion, spontaneity, or neither? Okay. And then for subjective meanings, does the Tishima chart indicate the speaker's view that the content of the closed sentence is undesirable? Yes or no? Uh, the station of the indicate the speaker's modesty towards the speech act, the act of conveying the message itself, or sensitivity for the addresses. And of course, I did um, a little bit of training if you needed it before starting the task. Um, uh, this is um, a sample of answer sheet by one informant. Okay, so this is to see the first question, second question, third question. They combine the result, then I uh, label. Okay, so this is um, referential type and subjective type, intersubjective type. Um, so this is when I combine the results. Uh, so as I said before, I allow uh, multiple meanings to be present in one token. So I marked the modesty meaning uh, intersubjective, regret meaning, spontaneity, and C. And whenever um, you detect um, two or three um, informants, um, so there are only three raters for this. Um, so all unanimous or two out of three um, rated, detected even. Um, modesty example, then I categorize this as a modesty type. Still mining the layers, context of layers. And here is how I uh, compile the three findings, three layer, one layer, two layer, three. Layer, three. And, and then here is the results. And so you can see that there are most of the tokens um, speaker, a uh, hearers, uh, interpret as having more than two <coughs> senses. And so, uh, regret and spontaneity is the most common type. And this time, <laughs> um, time. Um, I just want to highlight some findings. Subjectivity regret is the most common function. Intersubjectivity is emerging. Intersubjectivity means a layer with referential, uh, less or less intersubjective means. And uncertainty uh, of fluidity between spontaneity and adjusted sensitivity intersubjective mean was frequently observed. And I'm going to skip this part. It tells you about the strategy that here speaks. Sorry, so this is one example. So you know, Inkani Kanjicha this young man. My husband is a type of person who acutely senses that sort of thing. Uh, the speaker utters this in the context of describing what her husband is like, saying that he can sense how uh, someone is feeling when uh, even it has just met the person. All three, I, three informants identified with spontaneity as part of uh, the meaning of the child. Here, I em empathize that the sensing happens automatically. One format indicated that negativity is present, but that speech act, uh, sensitivity is not, while another informant had an uh, 
opposite response, commenting that the speaker softening the statement about herself, her husband, in this case, as an Ingu. The third month, Ingu man did not identify any Ingu. I'm going to just highlight, I'm going to stop with this slide because um, these are the types of comments I kept getting uh, in this that kind of example I just showed. So it sounds like a speaker softening yourself, a feel, I don't know what it is, but something is nuanced. I think this by the sentence, um, indicated by the sentence, the good thing at this point, the speaker has not felt bad. Um, now that I think about this example again, the answer to be yes. It sounded like soliloquy, so, um, and no Okay, so I just wanted to, yes, I, I'm going to stop here and since we have a discussion um, time. So there are basically some takeaways and conclusions. Thank you very much.